Hi, welcome back. In this session, I'd like to talk a little bit about disclosures, and in particular, financial disclosures that companies are required to make, how those disclosures have expanded over time, but in the process left, left us, in my view, worse off. So let's get the show on the road. Over the last few decades, disclosure rules have become more stringent across the world. This has come both from regulators and accountants, and companies are increasingly required to reveal more and more about themselves. As a consequence, annual reports, financial filings have all become heftier. Now, some of this, of course, is because companies have become more complex, they're more geographically diversified, they're more to reveal. But a lot of this has to come from disclosure requirements from rule writers, accounting rule writers, and market regulators. Now, of course, driving this disclosure trend is a belief that more is better, that investors cannot be hurt by having more information. After all, you can always leave aside information you don't need. So the rule is push for more disclosure. But is it really good for us? Are investors better off with all of this additional disclosure? That is the question I want to focus on in this session. So let's start at the very beginning. Publicly traded companies first showed up. They had to report to their shareholders. That was part of the requirements, but the requirements were meager. What companies were required to report was very minimal, and it varied across companies, and it depended largely on the whims of managers. Westinghouse Electric, at the start of the last century, between, I think, 1898 and 1905, did not hold an annual meeting or have an annual report. It was a publicly traded company. It took the Great Depression, for the New York Stock Exchange to wake up and recognize that it needed standardized and improved disclosure requirements and for government, the government to wake up. And essentially in 1933 and 1934, you had two of the biggest changes in security regulation in the US. The Securities Act of 1933, which created the SEC, and the Securities Exchange Act of 1934, which created much of this, the disclosure that we still see out there. Almost in parallel, the accounting profession was found its footing. You, you saw it start to write rules, and especially again in the aftermath of the, of the, of the Great Depression. GAAP made its appearance in 1933 with the Securities Act of 1933. And over the last eight decades, nine decades, accountants have made their presence felt. In parallel, as, as businesses have become more global and you've got publicly traded companies outside the US, you had the international analog to GAAP, IFRS, with its own rules, some similar to GAAP and some different. I'm going to focus on two filings with the SEC that companies have to make and use them as my lab experiments to illustrate what's happened to disclosure over time and why those changes might be counterproductive. The first of these filings is the 10K, an annual ritual that companies in the US have to go through where they file with the SEC uh, uh, basically a recording of what happened in the most recent fiscal year. The second is the S1, a filing made by private companies that plan to go public. So let's start with the 10K. Most US publicly tra <laughs> traded companies have to file a 10K. You're saying, why most, why not all? There's a threshold. You need at least 10 million in assets, which basically means all, most publicly traded companies are going to be above that threshold, and at least 2,000 shareholders. So most publicly traded companies file a 10K. And those 10Ks are getting larger. I'll use one company to illustrate this trend line. Coca-Cola, a company that's pretty much a beverage company. It's been a beverage company for a long time. It's expanded, added beverages. But in this chart, you see the number of pages in a Coca-Cola 10K going back to 1994. Now, of course, there are ups and downs across time, but if you look across the decades, in 1994 and 2000, the average page count in a 10K was about 115 pages. By the time you get to 2011 through 2020, that had almost doubled. Now you can say, well, something's happening at Coca-Cola. Maybe it's company specific. Well, to counter this, I'm going to draw on one of the most interesting studies. I don't read that much academic research, but this one was fascinating. It looked at 10Ks precisely for the reason I'm looking at them, to see what's happened in terms of size and readability. And they actually did a word count of 10Ks. And you can see in the word count where you can't lie the way you can with pages, 
What's happened to 10 Ks? Clearly the number of words in a 10 K has gone up manifold over the last two or three decades. And it's not, and you can look at the median to kind of indicate that the median number of words in a 10 K has gone from about 24,000 to 50,000. 10 Ks have doubled. But this study went well beyond counting words. They looked at what they called redundant words. These are words that show up multiple times, a phrase that shows up multiple times in the same 10K over and over and over and over again. Almost 3,000 words in the most recent year, in the 2013 10K, where that happened. A lot of words showing up over and over again. They also look for boilerplate words. These were words that showed up in at least 75% of all 10Ks across companies. So these are words that show up in every company's 10K. And guess what? A lot of those words too. If it feels like you're reading the same company's 10K over and over again, even though you're reading multiple companies, that's the reason. Finally, they looked at what they called sticky words. These were phrases that showed up in 10Ks for the same company year after year. It's almost cutting and pasting from previous years. Look at the number of words in that. Not only are 10Ks getting bigger, there are a lot more redundant words, a lot more boilerplate words, a lot more sticky words. Of course, this study went through 2013. I found an updated study that went through 2017, and guess what? The trend has continued. 10Ks have continued to grow. And these studies also looked at readability. Now, when you look at how to measure readability, there are, there are a couple of conventional tests out there. And one of the, one of the tests that, that, that you can look at is what kind of grade level you would need to be able to read something. So on one of these studies, they looked at 10K filings versus um, writings across all publications, newspapers, journals, and they, put, you know, and they looked at academic portions of it. They looked at the financial section of the Daily Telegraph, which is a British newspaper, and the rest of the paper of the Daily Telegraph. So let's start with what kind of grade level you'd need to read a newspaper. Well, you can see that that's actually decreased. You could read the Daily Telegraph, the rest of the paper, with about a 12th grade education. It's remained pretty stable for the financial section. It's a little higher for the rest, but take a look at what you need for the 10K. 10Ks have become more complex and more difficult to read. I think they're actually being charitable to 10Ks by looking at it in terms of grade level because this suggests that 10Ks contain bigger words, need better writing. That's not the case. I mean, I think I have more than 20 years of school education and when I read 10Ks, they strike me as unreadable. Not because the words are difficult to understand, but because it looks like they're written by lawyers and accountants melted into one. You know what happens? When a lawyer slash accountant writes something, it becomes unreadable to the rest of us. It's filled with legalese, double talk, buzzwords. Essentially, this readability has nothing to do with grade level. It's got to do with the fact that 10Ks are written to confuse, not inform. So 10Ks have become bigger, they've become less readable. So what's causing all of this? In one of these studies, they looked at the topics or the reasons. They actually looked at the so they actually looked at 10Ks, broke them down to 13 groupings based on topics, and they discovered that the biggest reason for the surge in pages in 10Ks is compliance requirements with the SEC and accounting standards. That's this. You know, the, the, if if you look at this chart, it's a it's a it's a number four in the chart. And you can see how it's expanded over time. They actually also looked at which sections of the 10K are causing the bloat. You know the three sections that are causing the bulk of the bloat? The first is the fair value impairment section. This is where accountants come into your company every year. They revalue everything. They impair goodwill. They, you know, they cost a heck of a lot of money. I don't know how many tens of thousands of hours of accounting time, appraiser time is spent on this fair value impairment. The second big section that's caused the bloat is what's called the internal control section. To be quite honest, I've never quite understood what this section is about. It's about, it, it's, a, it, it's an outgrowth of Sarbanes-Oxley, that law that was passed to improve corporate governance. Well, it's supposed to show that managers are in control at firms, that they have internal systems to catch fraud mistakes when they happen. And the third is the risk factor section, where companies to list out the risk factors. If I were to name the three most useless sections of a 10K, these would be the three sections that I would name. 
I mean, I have, I mean, they clearly create a lot of work for people. The risk factor section makes a lot of, that employs a lot of lawyers. The internal control section probably need, puts a, keeps a lot of auditors in their jobs. And the fair value impairment section is a gold mine for accounting and appraisal firms. So I can understand it creates a lot of employment. This is good, right? But from my perspective as an investor, these are the three most useless sections in a 10K. I'm, I, might, this might, I might be overstating it, but I've never read anything useful in a risk section of any company that I value. Because it's written by lawyers and it states the obvious things like, if our competitors do much better than we think they will, we're in trouble. Okay, thank you for letting me know. On the internal control section, the fact that managers self-assess that they have control systems in place tells me absolutely nothing. That's for the fair value impairment section. By the time accountants figure out that something has been impaired, the rest of the world has moved on. I remember last year, or two years ago, when SoftBank uh, made that ill-fated investment in WeWork and the investment fell apart, the IPO collapsed. In November of 2019, accountants at SoftBank wrote down SoftBank's investment in WeWork to reflect the loss. But you know what the rest of the world knew in September? So it's three sections that investors have little use for that are sucking up so much of the 10K pages. So 10Ks have become bigger, they become less readable, and the sections that have become bigger have become the least useful sections. What about prospectuses or the S1? Well, one very simple way of measuring how S1, uh, S1s have evolved over time is to look at a couple of high-profile IPOs from four different decades, 80s, the 90s, the 2000 uh, to 2009, and 2010 to 19, and I even throw in 2020 for good measure. Just take a look at the number of pages in the 10K. Apple's prospectus was considered big at the time that it went public. It was 73 pages long. Microsoft was about 69 if you include the appendices. So Apple and Microsoft, two extraordinarily successful companies today, when they went public, took about 70 pages in their prospectus. In contrast, take a look at Uber and Airbnb. I mean, this isn't war and peace. These are the prospectuses for these companies. In the case of Uber, if you count the appendices, it's about 380 pages. In the case of Airbnb, it's even bigger. It's 430 pages. I will give you, I, I will pose a challenge to you. If you can find the, the Microsoft prospectus, and I found it with the Google search, find it and read it. And then read the Uber prospectus and tell me which one informs you more and I know I will let you make that judgment because I am, you know, my answer is, is, is Microsoft's far easier to work with, far more informative than Uber's was. So why, if they've become so much longer, have they not become more informative? I think that I can think of three reasons. One is a lot more words in the newer prospectuses. But at the end of the reading, you're left even more confused than you began. Let me give you an example. One of the numbers you need to get a value per share for a company is share count. How many shares are outstanding? So I opened up the Airbnb prospectus and they were very helpful. They told me that after their initial public offering, there would be 47.36 million class A shares and 490.89 class B shares. And I said, good, I'm done. And then they said, oh, by the way, this share count excludes 30.87 million options on class A shares. I said, okay. And 13.79 million options on class B shares. I said, okay. And then they threw in almost five different classes of what are called restricted stock units, which are really shares that will be outstanding sooner rather than later, granted to employees over time. At the end of the process, I wasn't sure why they were excluding the 37.51 million shares. And they left that question completely unanswered. And, I, and, and, and as an investor in Airbnb, I was left absolutely confused about what the actual, actual share count was. Second, for whatever reason, the SEC, and it's not just the SEC, other regulatory rule writers seem to have restrictions on companies making detailed projections about the future. I know they're doing it to help us as investors, that they're worried that we might be led down the garden path by companies painting these big pictures of the future. 
But I think by doing so, they're actually letting companies get away with storytelling without any of the consequent details. I mean, let me give you a couple of ways in which companies use the disclosure restrictions on projections to their advantage. In almost every prospectus I've seen in the last few years for companies, one of the key metrics that they emphasize is called a TAM, a total addressable market, supposedly the total market the company is going after. And these numbers are astronomically high. I'll give you a couple of examples. Uber claimed its total accessible market was 5.2 trillion. You know what they counted in there? Everything that people spend on passenger cars, what they spend on mass transit, it was all in there. Now your question should be, why would a car service company be able to claim this entire market? That question's unanswered, but you know what Uber hopes you will take out of this. They, you, you will see the 5.2 trillion, and from there jump to the conclusion that Uber could have a trillion dollars in revenues. Airbnb claimed its total accessible market was 3.4 trillion. Okay, we can debate how good a company Airbnb is, but that 3.5 trillion was five times larger than the entire hotel market revenues were in 2019. Do you see where I'm going? By letting companies put numbers out like total addressable market and not allowing them to specify details, you're letting them get, you know, you know, get the best of storytelling. They can throw out these big parts of stories and not be held accountable. And finally, there's a lot of creative framing that's happening in these prospectors. What do I mean by that? I mean, let's face it, most companies going public today are money losing cash burning machines. But in their prospectors, they found ways to make it look like they're making money. By doing what? By adding back everything but the kitchen sink to come up with what they call adjusted earnings or adjusted EBITDA. Now we can spend an entire session on these adjustments, but the bottom line is by allowing bloat, we've allowed companies to be able to kind of expand stories without any of the consequences. So here's the bottom line. I don't think added disclosure is helping investors and trading if traders, if that's who it's designed to help. And I can give five reasons why. The first is that you have information overload as 10Ks and S1s, annual reports, I mean, filings in general get bigger and bigger, a few things happen. One is that, uh, you know, it gets more and more difficult to find relevant information because you're searching for the things that matter. Second, there are all these distractions. Like You're like a dog in, uh, um, in an open meadow with rabbits running all around. You're, you're chasing things you shouldn't be chasing. The big stuff melts in with the small stuff. And in a strange way, as these, these company filings get bigger and bigger, investors do, and behavioral finance is very clear on this, they fall back on what are called mental shortcuts. What do they do? They come up with some metric, market price per user. They ignore everything. So in a sense, the perverse effect of supplying people with this overload is they ignore everything you're telling them, and they use a mental shortcut instead. This is the second problem. This seems to be a feedback loop for companies where they think that if they disclose something, they can do, they can adopt rules and practices that are patently unfair. This is especially true in corporate governance, where disclosure requirements have become more stringent over the last two decades. That's good, right? You know what, what companies have done because disclosure requirements have become more stringent? They've decided they can adopt unfair you know, shares with different voting rights, you know, have captive boards. As long as they disclose them, that's okay, right? I mean, it seems to be almost a version of, um, of, of if you sin and then you confess the sins, the sin is forgiven. So bad behavior is now okay as long as you disclose it. If you don't believe me, take a look at the WeWork prospectus, where the company is absolutely open about some of the most egregious practices I've ever seen in a company. Like what? Like the, the notion that you can replace, that a CEO's wife gets to replace the CEO of a publicly traded company. WeWork put that down, disclosed it, and said, we've disclosed it. Why are you yelling at us? The third problem, I think, is that the rule writers need to make up their mind about who the audience they're catering to in the disclosures. 
Let's face it, companies have to do disclosures to governments for regulatory purposes and taxes, to consumers when they sell them goods and services, to bankers when they borrow money, to shareholders. If you try to take all of these audiences and take the disclosures that each of them needs, because they need very different disclosures, put them all into one report, you're asking for chaos. And I have a feeling that the modern 10K and S1, you're trying to cater to multiple audiences. The fourth problem I think is, and I think it's the nature of the kinds of people who go into rule writing. They tend to be linear thinkers, rule followers. Disclosure rules are backward looking. They require extensive disclosure of things that have happened in the past. They actually restrict you on trying to make projections of the future. But investing is forward looking. And finally, there is some mission confusion. Is the end game in, with disclosure laws to make investors more informed? Is that what you're trying to do? Because that's what I thought you were trying to do. Or is it to protect them from their own mistakes? I have a feeling looking at some of the developments in disclosure that it's a ladder that's driving much of the rule writing, that you're trying to protect investors and traders from their own mistakes. So let's take a look. Information overload, you know, you, you have distractions, you, have confu you confuse the small and the big, and you take mental shortcuts. You now you see that all the time as you read 10Ks. You know, I, you know, I did a, a YouTube video a while back using the Procter & Gamble 10K to illustrate how little of a 10K is actually of use in investing and how much of it gets thrown away. Second, as I said, you know, you know regulators have lost sight of their audience. And even when they think about people in markets, they need to realize that most people in markets are not investors, they're traders. You're saying, what's the difference? Now, it um, goes back to a distinction I've long drawn in my, in my classes, in my web posts, in my writing, between value and price. Value is driven by cash flows, growth and, you know, and risk, and price is driven by demand and supply. Investors try to assess value and buy things that sell for less than the value. Traders try to buy at a low price and sell at a high price. Their focus is looking to see what other people are paying for similar assets. Most people in markets are traders. Unfortunately, disclosure rule writers seem to think they're writing rules for investors. So almost everything in disclosure is about helping investors. There's very little in disclosure that helps traders. Now, what would help traders? I think S1s, the prospectus for companies going public, should include all VC rounds that the companies had to go through and the pricing attached by VCs. Investors might not care, but traders do. All publicly traded companies in the 10Ks should be required to at least give more information on the metrics that people price companies, whether it's EBITDA, net income, and the peer group against which they measure themselves. Something that traders want, but investors don't. So something to think about as you think about disclosure rules. And as for the future and the past, I know it's, you know, I, I know why regulators restrict companies from forecasting the future and make projections. They worry that companies are going to paint these over-optimistic forecasts for the future, and they're trying to protect investors from getting misled. And I'm sorry, but I, I don't think that protection is even possible. Of course, companies are going to exaggerate their strengths and minimize their weaknesses. We all know that. And you've got to trust investors to make their own corrections to these forecasts. But more critically, preventing companies from doing this doesn't mean other people won't. In fact, by preventing companies from making these projections, you're leaving the game wide open for others, analysts, market experts, salespeople, who often are less scrupulous and less informed than the company to make these same forecasts. Markets are more a vacuum and these people fill in. And finally, as I said, you know, there's a lot of mission confusion here because as I, you know, if your end game is to inform investors, the way disclosures would have evolved would have been very different. The way they've evolved instead has become about protecting investors and when that's the end game, you're gonna get what we get with disclosures today, which they become risk averse, they become lawyerly, they become templates where companies follow check boxes and provide very little information. I know nobody cares what I think about disclosure, but if I were to write disclosure first principles, here are the things I would emphasize. First, 
less is more. Now, make, we need to bring disclosures down. These 250-page annual reports and prospectuses cannot stand. I know it's easier said than done, but here are three ways I think we can start. First is take those big three we talked about, the risk profile, internal control, fair value. They need to be drastically reduced. You know, people are going to be put out of work and I feel sorry for them. But, you know, I shouldn't be paying the price for employing accountants, auditors and lawyers. The second is I'm going to borrow a principle that actually I, I would say I enforced, but my wife enforced on me, which is I have a limited closet space and I hate, you know, and I like buying t-shirts. There's a one in one out rule in our house, which is if I buy a new t-shirt, one, uh, one old one has to go out. Similar rule need, needs to stand in the disclosure space. If we want to add a new disclosure, some existing disclosure has to come out. Let them fight it out. And third, if you have disclosures where you're using words, remember we talked about boilerplate language, sticky language. Now we have, you know, programs that can read annual reports and tell you which portions of a report are just repeating things the company said before. And maybe that word test needs to be used to reduce the size of disclosures. Second, don't forget traders, which is so much of disclosures about, you know, about investors. We need some, some focus on traders as well. And I gave the suggestions of adding VC rounds to prospectuses. Third, stop this restriction on projections. Investing is about the future. And especially with younger companies, you need to let companies tell full stories. And in fact, by doing this, we are going to be able to hold them accountable. Because when you tell full stories, you need to fill in the details. When you fill in the details, I can measure your progress towards those details. Finally, there are some companies today, especially in today's day and age, who market themselves based not on their revenues or margins, but on the number of users they have, their subscribers and customers. And I think you should let them with a caveat, which is if you as a company, say Netflix with subscribers or um, Uber with riders, wants to use that as your launching pad for your story, you need to provide full information on those what I call unit economics that, that are driving your business model. So if you're a company that wants to market on based on subscribers, I need to know churn rates and renewal rates for your subscribers, the cost of acquiring a subscriber. If you're talking about users, I need to know user acquisition costs. Again, churn and renewal rates, cohort tables that tell me, you know, how do people who've been on your platform longer perform relative to people who've been on for less periods? But I think it has to be triggered. You can't require this for all companies because a lot of companies, this is just going to be added in, added data in, in a report that nobody uses. So I, you know, I, I know that um, when you have dysfunctional systems and processes, and I think the disclosure process now is dysfunctional, it's not easy to change them because there are vested interests that now make money off that dysfunctional process. So I'm sure that there will be many reasons people find for not making any of these changes. But as somebody consumes this information, I think, I, oh no, I think I'd like to see these changes. And on a final count, I know there is a new fight broom you know, you know, on the horizon, which is on ESG disclosure. That train's left the station already, it's coming. I know companies are going to be asked to provide more information on ESG, and at first sight you're saying, what's wrong with that? We all need to know more about companies. But I think that if we want to make these ESG disclosures actually matter, you know, matter in the sense that you want companies to behave better, we've got to focus on making them, you know, those disclosures have to be focused on those dimensions of ESG that are material. There's a lot of stuff in ESG that shouldn't even make the top five list. Second, they need to, I think they need to use, you can't allow companies to go on for pages and pages about you know, fuzzy stuff on ESG where you need something explicit you can use to measure it and you cannot, you cannot let the ESG consultants and measurement services tell you what should be in the disclosure. That is a recipe for disaster. So let's see how that evolves. I hope you found the session useful and thank you very much for listening. Take care.